excited. Uh, we have uh, obviously two, uh, two great leaders in terms of the space business with a uh, very similar background. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome and thank the president of the Canadian Space Agency, General Walter Detinja, for joining us. And uh, I, I was practicing Walter for a long time. And uh, General Detinja has been the uh, Canadian uh, Space Agency president for a little bit over a year. And before that, uh, spent I think about 38 years uh, in the Canadian uh, uh, services and working a lot of different activities in Iraq and as well as uh, uh, different natural uh, recoveries in terms of different situations. Uh, we also have the NASA Administrator, Charlie Bolden, and Charlie's now been the NASA Administrator uh, for over five years. And before that, served about 34 years in the Marine Corps, but 14 of those years were also with NASA. And as you know, he's flown uh, four uh, shuttle flights. And so we're really appreciative uh, for you to join us for this uh, special session uh, with the young professionals. And uh, one of the things I'd start with is, uh, I guess, the issue of collaboration. You both talked uh, at the uh, heads of agencies about the importance of collaboration and cooperation. Uh, and I'll start with uh, General Walt. Uh, and uh, one of the things you talked about was uh, the importance of collaboration. You've worked, obviously, in the military uh, for for a long period of time and now in a space agency. What's the difference in terms of collaboration from the standpoint of a space agency and from the standpoint of a uh, military organization? Is there a difference or is it, has, how do you approach that? I guess from my standpoint, and thanks again uh, for having me here. It's, uh, it's a real honor to be here and share the stage uh, with Charlie and, and uh, with all of you, the, really the future uh, future leadership of, uh, of the space community. Um, I guess from my standpoint, we're all dealing with people. And uh, it's about relationships. And no matter what level of command I was in, whether it was in the military or today, uh, I would always say it's about relationships. And so this collaboration is key. You know, when you're, when you're working with your closest friends and allies, and, and certainly here in North America, we're in this lovely town of of Toronto, uh, I just shared a story with uh, with Charlie uh, here recently that you know there's a fort nearby. It's called Fort York. And in 1813, U.S. military showed up in their ships uh, on Lake Ontario, attacked York, burned the place down, and blew up the army. And a year later, uh, the British fleet went down to Washington and burned it down. And now we're the best of friends. <laughs> and we're the best of friends because the relationship has in it implicit trust and confidence. And when we talk about relationships in space, because the risks are so high, because it's such an adverse environment, it requires absolute trust and confidence. And that's why space is so important to this community. That's why all of you are here in this room, no matter the fact you came from so many different countries. That you are sharing an experience here that we hope will result in a long-term relationship built upon trust and confidence. And so again, go right back to the beginning. It is about relationships, and from my view, no different whether you're wearing a uniform or not. Technical organization like space and the military, the people is the theme. And of course, I've heard from Charlie for many years about the importance of people, and you, you talked about that. From the standpoint of your personal relationships, uh, obviously NASA has had a very long collaboration with the Canadian Space Agency, and you've also worked uh, closely uh, with General Walt for over a year now. How do personal relationships uh, impact how you do international collaboration? Not able to establish um, at least an understanding of who the other person is, uh, things don't work out. Uh, I always tell people, I said, one of the bad things about Americans and, and our culture is we like to do things right now. Uh, we're the only people in the world that work that way. Uh, almost. Almost every other culture, and I know, you know, Walt and I have been in a lot of the same places. Almost every culture in the world, um, you don't even talk business for days if not weeks or months, because what you do 
is you engender a relationship and a trust, uh, a trust relationship, and then you can talk to each other. But to try to make a deal or to seal a deal before you've established that relationship, you're just wasting your time. Uh, so I think uh, you know what Walt says is absolutely right. It is the personal trust relationship that comes from just getting to know each other. What is so great about uh, when we were with the space generation earlier uh, in the week, one of the things they kept saying was the value of having been able to come together from countries all over the world, spend time, not, not just in the technical discussion, but uh, you know, building camaraderie in, in the bar or other things like that. Those are really, really, really important things to do. So I think that's, that's key to our relationship. I just remember last year when uh, Charlie and I met for the first time last July, it was at the Canadian Embassy, and we met for the first time, and, and I'd seen, seen uh, your, your, your bio there, Charlie, and we started talking about the guys and gals that we knew. <laughs> and after about an hour of discussion, one of the staffers came up and said, maybe you two ought to start talking about space. <laughs> But the fact is, we have so many uh, common friends. And, and the fact is, based upon that, we know each other. You know, in the military, it's always easy because you can walk up to someone in a uniform and you see all the badges and the ribbons and you say, okay, I know exactly where you were. When were you there? I was there too. I know you. And yet, as civilians to come up, the resume is not up on the chest, right? The resume is not there. It's not on the uniform. And yet there is so much of a shared experience. And to know the shared experience, you've got to talk. And you've got to have that bond of trust, which often doesn't happen in a formal setting, but at the bar. Right. It's the relationship, it's the connection, that's interesting. The, um, so one of the things, uh, Charlie, you're very supportive of these events. You spend a lot of time doing that. And obviously NASA has been very, uh, you know, very involved in international collaboration. Most of our programs and projects are international. What's the role that you play as administrator to facilitate you know, the, uh, uh, the international collaboration and the, the, the success of the missions that we have with the partners? I think you hit the nail on the head, the word you use is facilitate. I, I tell people all the time, I don't do an awful lot. Um, my job is not, I'm not the action guy. My job is to facilitate the success of the people who work uh, with me and with whom I work. Um, you know, I, I tell people frequently that I've spent 34 years in the Marine Corps and people supported me and they got me where I wanted to go and I learned when I became a general officer that it was now time to flip it and, and I was supposed to take care of them and, and serve them. So, so I, I try to do the same thing in NASA. I, I tell, I think I met with some young folk last night and somebody asked me about, uh, you know, what, what are some of the key things you know I learned very early on, and well, I learned it in my mother and dad's dinner table, but I learned it at the Naval Academy and the Marine Corps. Take care of your people, and they will take care of you. Um, if you're out for yourself, and that's what your focus is, uh, they will know it, and they will know it very quickly. And, and the trust that, that Walt and I talk about, it just it won't happen, because uh, it's really hard to trust someone when all you see in every action is, how am I going to progress how am I going to push myself forward and not thinking about the rest of the team? So my job as a NASA administrator is really to try to facilitate the success of, of my team. Uh, if I can get a chance to meet and collaborate with the leaders of the other agencies uh, to kind of smooth the waters so that guys like Bill Gerstenmeyer and John Grunsfeld and, and, and the other leaders can go in and they know that what they say to their counterparts uh, when they go back and talk to the leader, he's gonna, he or she is gonna reflect the same thing. And I've, I've kind of done my job, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, your behavior, as I mentioned, you're always, you take a lot of time with the people, obviously with your partners, but even before, because with the different programs we would do, whenever we would ask you to kind of talk, uh, Charlie would always say yes. So uh, that, that's, that's been always consistent. Uh, so, uh, General, from your standpoint, uh, the Canadian Space Agency, uh, you said it was an enabler to a lot of things that go on in space, and you have very strong uh, collaborations uh, with many, many space agencies. What do you see as some of the key challenges and the opportunities uh, as uh, CSA, you know, moves into the future? Yeah, I would say uh, just to, to reinforce what uh, Charlie just mentioned, 
terms of senior leadership, I find my role is opening doors. Uh, opening doors so that the staffs can get together and find out what common interests that they have. I think the challenge is that there's so many great ideas out there. Uh, you know, when I go from coast to coast and I, and I go visit a company, it might be a small company, but the innovation is extraordinary. And, and, I, and again, I'm the new guy to the space business, okay? I look to incredible practitioners who have been around for a long time, and, and they kind of know the biz, but I kind of look to the, to, the, uh, to the great folks that bring along with me, and I say, are you aware of this? And no one has a clue about an innovation that is somewhere in a little skunk work somewhere. And that if it was teamed up with the other kinds of ideas out there, you put in the right amount of financing, and it just blossoms. And, and it's always a race against time, you know? So it, it's understanding the landscape in, in our country, but also along a thematic basis, what else is out there? And, and that's why this, this gathering is so important. And so often it's by happenstance that people stand together, they hear another conversation, they recognize there's a common theme, they go, hey, what are you doing? That's that, in my view, is the challenge. And people keep talking about resources, resources, resources. Guess what? If it's a great idea, the money will come. It may not always come from the public, but certainly from, from the private sector. Because if it's a winning formula and it's going to take off, everybody wants a piece of it. So from my view, just understanding what's out there. So thanks for doing what you're doing. And as a... Uh Maybe as a follow-up from, from your perspective, one of the things you've talked about was the importance uh, the other day of uh, uh, learning lessons. And uh, it's a project business. Projects need to learn from projects. Missions need to learn from missions. Um, and this probably also goes back, I would assume, to your military background in terms of combat operations and uh, national disasters and recovery and things like that. Are there certain things that you try to instill in your organization and in your people in terms of how to most effectively learn lessons, uh, whether it's after action reviews or, or other approaches like that? Yeah, I, I guess, and again, Charlie and I have pretty similar experiences. It, it, it's a lesson observed, it's not a lesson learned unless it's changed behavior. And when you're in combat, when you're in an operational setting, uh, unless you've actually learned the lesson, more people get hurt. You know, and, and I used to talk about actionable lessons learned. And, and how did you change your behavior to get on with it to save lives? And the same applies to the space business because of the risk nature of what we have, the, the thresholds of risk that we have, the environment that we deal with. And, and the idea that how quickly can we identify that lesson and turn it into an applied lesson. Uh, and it's always, in that case, a race against time, too. I can give you many examples of, of, of combat operations, and I'm sure that, and I'm sure that uh, Charlie can as well. But to have the courage to come forward and say, you know, we made a mistake. And the point that Charlie made is really key. If it's about you and about your ambition, and you have a goal to advance, and you think that if you admit that there is an error that will hurt your career, then we have a big problem. Then we have a big problem because it's, it's very difficult to say, hey, listen, we have a mistake here. And it's on my watch, but we've got to fix it, like, right away. And you've got to look to the success of the team and put the, put the organization ahead of you in order to actually learn from that lesson applied. Right. So the most important technique I would gather is you want people who are working for you basically tell you the truth when there's a problem, when things are going in a different direction. As I say, tell me my baby's sin. ugly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, every baby's ugly yeah. <laughs> at birth. Most babies. Okay, not every baby. <laughs> but I have very seldom seen an ugly baby that doesn't just become the most beautiful thing in the world. You know, after a, a few hours, you get it cleaned up and straightened up and all that kind of stuff. So I don't mind somebody telling me my baby's ugly uh, because then I can go back, clean it up, Pat it and powder it and all that kind of stuff. It, it's the be most beautiful thing in the world. I would ask we do you some ugly babies yeah, <laughs> in, the, in the space program. And also, so also as an astronaut, and as uh, in terms of your combat experience, are there any techniques or things you look to in terms of organizationally? I, I know the voice of dissent is one thing yeah. you've been 
talking a lot about the importance of people and talking up. Is there? I, you know, I'll share that with people, and I, uh, I tell people all the time, when in especially in my senior leadership team meetings, uh, I tell them it doesn't do any good for you all to sit here and just shake your head yes, particularly if you disagree. I said, you know, I don't. I am never the smartest one in the room. Uh, never. I have never been in the room when I'm the smartest one in the room, especially when I'm with my three granddaughters who are 8, 14, and, and 12. Uh, so I recognize that, so I don't, I don't have to worry about that part. And, and I said, look, we can do a lot of things and we can do great things, but we've got to make sure that we're all on the same sheet of music. And, um, you know, I, I'm certain Walt would tell you the same thing. Before you do any, um, any combat operation, everybody gets to speak up. And, um, and I'll tell you, in the Marine Corps, you expect the lowest ranking person because that's usually going to, I'm not an infantryman, but I've, but I've been trained to be one. And, and when you go out on an infantry operation, it is not the general who's out front. It's usually some lance corporal or private first class who's doing what we call walking point. And the lives of everybody else in that unit depends on the lance corporal out front. And so you sure do want his or her uh, input into what you're getting ready to do. Because you, you know, you come up with some stupid plans sometimes. To be blunt, and it's I, I would much rather have somebody say, I, I know you think that's okay, but I, it, I don't understand. Just, just tell me you don't understand. If I can't explain it to you, there's something wrong. Uh, to be quite honest, we have one of our biggest problems in the in 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 space agencies across the world. We, I talk about we talk about it among the international partners all the time. Is helping people understand the strategy that we feel is best for the nation and the world and the partners. And if we can't explain it, it is not that good. Uh, it may be brilliant to us, but if nobody else understands it other than us, it's just not that good. There's something missing. So uh, asking for dissent, asking for differences of opinion, uh, asking for input, but the biggest thing is, I, I'm a big person on diversity and inclusion, and, and the inclusion part is the most important part. If you ask people for input and you don't accept it, uh, th they won't they won't respond very very many times. So you've got to be open to accepting whatever it is that they say when you ask for. And if you uh, exactly where you are, Charlie, and if you can take some action to demonstrate that you listen, yeah. show that you listen. You know, I believe in leadership by walking around. I'll walk around the space agency, be sitting in somebody's cubicle, they'll turn, turn around and go, boom! <laughs> it's the president, hey, how you doing? You know, I'll go down to the cafeteria, sit down with someone, and they'll share an idea. And that's terrific, you know? And then, and then you kind of go back and you reinforce the chain of command, obviously, but at the same time say, you know, I've got a brilliant idea there. Carry it forward. And, and, and sometimes when you know, it's been missed to go back to the chain of command and say, what about that one? And demonstrating that you're listening. Because if you set that climate, if you set the environment, people will come forward. And they want to. Because what I found is all the good ideas come from within the organization. Rarely are they top down. They're bottom up. And uh, now we, we're going to get some questions from the audience. So this will, these will be, I think, yeah, some good questions. And the first one I have is from, uh, let's see, Kevin Stoop of the Planetary Society. And it says, is there any mechanism that could be used to have young professionals do exchanges on a one-for-one -one basis between the two space agencies? So is there anything that could be done between uh, CSA and NASA exchanging young professionals? There's a criteria, do they play hockey? <laughs> <laughs> or baseball or football, that's okay. I, I, I don't see any impediment. I mean, uh, I think it's a great idea. Never, I've never been asked, so it, you know, it's something we, we probably need to think about. So One on where's, where's OB? Taking notes? All right. All right. Now, we don't want to give actions, because then, well, I uh, hear about it afterwards. Uh, so this question is from Sam uh, Marquardt, uh, George Washington University. And the question is, we've heard many of the uh, leaders of the space agencies talk about the importance of international collaboration, but many barriers to cooperation exist due to export control laws. What can we do as nations, as the young professionals in the industry, 
to collaborate when we are constrained by export controls and other political pressures. So um, how do you collaborate with uh, the kind of uh, external controls that are out there and what can, what can they do? I don't think the external controls prohibit collaboration at all. I mean, you look at everything that we do, ev almost every, uh, every mission that we fly is a, is a collaboration with international partners. We know what the guidelines are, we know what the constraints are, and we find ways to make sure that we comply with them. Uh, you know, material that, or information that, that should not go outside the U.S. sector, you just make sure that it's protected efficiently or sufficiently, and you press on. So that, uh, you know, I'm, I've not found export control, ITAR, other kinds of things. Are they hard? Yes. Uh, are they necessary? Yes. Are they excessive sometimes? Yes. But it doesn't keep us from, from working with people. You know, Walt, being in Afghanistan and Iraq and everywhere else, uh, you know, he had troops from I don't know how many nations. And you couldn't, you couldn't say, okay, because you guys can't have access to this, we're not gonna go fight. You have to figure out a way around it and figure out who can get what information and then go. And it, I, I think everybody in the team understands, they may not like it, but they understand that, okay, I can't get access to that. I would love to, but I can't. Now, having been on United Nations missions, being on NATO missions, being on multinational force missions, it's exactly as Charlie kind of laid out. You know what you can do, you gotta try to find the way. And, and, and don't focus on those areas where, hey listen, the reality is there are some challenges, but find those areas where you can do more together. I'll go, let me go back real quick to the question about collaborate, about inter exchanging the issue, the problem, and I know it, you know, we'll, we'll run into bureaucracy. You may as well say it up front. The bureaucracy will be, okay, they're a non-US citizen, or that person is a non-Canadian citizen. But even that can be worked around, you know, if you know what it is you're trying to do. We have a very robust foreign national management access control program. I know it very well because I've been testifying before Congress many times about it. All you have to do is burp once and, uh, you know, not do it and you'll learn about it. But, but that system is put in place so that it does allow us to have uh, non-US citizens uh, work in, in a US environment, but, but it's, you just gotta comply with all the bureaucracy, but it can be done. Yeah, also a lot of the um, signers I've seen, they typically start at least informally, where someone's doing somebody something good, they're working for someone else, then, then managers start talking and, and effectively working the system, but it, but it can be hard work. And it probably should be, not should But be. again, having been on exchange with the U.S. Army for three and a half years, uh, by the way, I now have a, a Texan accent, both in English and in French. <laughs> so bonjour, y'all. <laughs> but the fact is that having exchanges uh, is just opens up so much. Uh, but there are challenges. Uh, if we can find a way around it, they're, they're invaluable. Okay. So this is a question from Max Bernier Grido uh, from looks like uh, International Space University. And it says, is the Canadian Space Agency and NASA, are they too risk adverse? And he, he says the context, we seem to accept a certain degree of risk with the military, but not so much with government space activities. So do you feel that uh, the space agencies uh, are too risk averse? I guess I'd say that, you know, when you're in combat, you try to ensure uh, that each, all those men and women who are at the point of the spear can achieve their mission and come home to their loved ones safely. And, and all of the training, all of the equipment, all of the thought process is there to do that. Involving circumstances that are totally unforeseen once you cross the line of departure. With regard to space, and again, Charlie knows a lot more than, about this than I do, the fact that it is very, very dangerous. And you're pushing the envelope, but you have a say in terms of the sequencing. And you're trying to control as many of the circumstances as you can. And again, A, you don't want to hurt anybody. And B, you want to make sure whatever significant investment you have follows through with the objective. So I think you gotta be very, very deliberate, and I just wish from a military standpoint, we could have controlled as many of the variables so that no one got hurt. And I will 
won't take issue with anybody that says that the military is less risk averse than NASA or CSA. Uh, for anybody in, in the room who served in the military, the military is not risk averse. Uh, when you talk about the checks and balances before you do anything, particularly in training, um, a complaint by young pilots, for example, is I can't do anything that you used to be able to do. And that's because we've learned lessons in blood and you don't need to repeat it. And so, you know, my son and I used to have this discussion. He's an F-18 backseat or a whistle, and, and he just complained to me one day. He said, you know, it's not fair. I said, what's not fair? He said, I can't do anything that I hear you and your guys talk about, you and your, your friends. I said, that's right, because we were stupid, you know, and, and we went out and lost people, and we did stupid things. And so you don't have to be stupid the way your dad was uh, to learn the lessons that we learned the hard way. You'll, you'll get the job done. You'll have just as much fun. Uh, you, you only think that it was exciting when we were doing it. We were just stupid doing it. And obviously, there's also different players in the space business entrepreneurs who, who probably you know, play different roles in terms of, of innovation and risk and all that. Um, here's a question uh, from Marcus Murdy, uh, University of Alabama, Huntsville. And it, it's for, for Charlie Bolden, but I think both be able to respond to this. It says, in the last few years, uh, NASA's budgets have declined and civil servant salaries uh, have stagnated. Yet NASA is consistently rated the best U.S. agent and the underscored best in capital letters, the best federal agency to work for in the United States. What leadership strategies do you utilize to motivate your workforce? So for both of you, it's, it's, you know, it's difficult. Uh, economic times. How do you go about uh, maintaining a positive workforce that people want to work at? What are some of your leadership strategies to be successful? You know, this is um, it's fascinating. We're, 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 we've been through this recession. This recession started in 2008, uh, just months after I became the Chief of Defense uh, in Canada. And, and it's interesting because it, it, it hit everyone hard. It's hit the international community as, uh, as, as uh, governments tried to uh, control their expenses and, and try to uh, regain momentum in their economies. But, you know, as you mentioned before, I had almost 38 years of service, and so it, all of this is cyclical. You, you know, I can remember in the early 90s when we went through the same thing, and for the Canadian military, we had a 35% cut in both resources and people. 35% is pretty significant. Okay, and at the same time where we had pretty significant operational tempo in uh, Bosnia and in Kosovo, and I was a commanding officer in, in Petawawa, Ontario, and I had 750 soldiers, I was, a, I was tanks, armored cars, uh, you know, extraordinary organization. My budget for one year was $400,000. And I said to my brigade commander, hey boss, if I don't even roll one truck, if I just sit in garrison and buy box lunches for my duty picket and, and photocopy paper, paper clips, that cost me 200000 a year. But I'm going to spend whatever money I have to move, shoot, and communicate so that if, if Government of Canada sends us to conflict, we're going to win. And then I would meet with my troops every month, do town halls with them. And I said, here's the scoop. I don't give you a pay raise. I can't promote you. That's what those folks back in Ottawa do. But I can create the conditions so you're happy to come to work each and every day. That you're happy to be part of this regiment, you're happy to be part of this family. And that's what you do, because senior leaders set the tone. Because normally this budget thing is a cyclical thing, and you know at some point you're going to come out of the drought. And you want to keep the best folks on your team. And the moment there isn't the hope that you're going to come out of that drought, they're going to go somewhere else. And so senior leaders set the tone. I've given that speech a few times. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people are going to want to start working for you guys. Yeah. So, Charlie, how do you take yeah, credit? What do you do as a leader? Oh, I don't you, take credit. <laughs> well, you've been in the last five uh, years and we've been... Yeah, I, I, but I didn't do it. it it's... Okay. Um, I, the difference for us was a woman by the name of Jerry Buckholz. Uh, about four years ago, um, the person that runs NASA, that is the senior official for human capital, uh, Jerry Buckholz, came to us from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And uh, Jerry said, 
I, I didn't even know about what we call every uh, EVS, uh, Employee Viewpoint Surveys. And she said, you know, the Employee Viewpoint Survey is getting ready to come out. Uh, it's really important for us to get people to, to comment and everything. And so I said, okay, tell me what we need to do. And, and Jerry made a very important point. Don't let a day go by without telling people that they're worthwhile, that they're valued, uh, that they're doing a good job, if they are. And, uh, and most importantly, remember that the people who are the mentors and the role models, most people don't get to see you, but they do see the branch chiefs and the section chiefs and the mid-level managers, so really focus on them. It would be like Walt talking to his sergeants. Uh, you know, the troops, uh, there's some buck sergeant down there that, that's kicking their butt. And, uh, and that's who they want to be like when they grow up. They, they don't even, nowadays they know generals, but I, when Walt and I were younger, you did not know a general. You did not want to know a general. Today is, today is really different, you know. Obi's laughing over there, man. You, if you saw a general coming, you went the other way. You did not want to be anywhere close. It's not like that today. But, but even, even today, it's still the sergeants and the staff sergeants and the, the non-commissioned officers. And, and for us in, in NASA and the Canadian Space Agency, it's the mid-level managers that are the role models. And I don't care whether you're in Lockheed Martin or whether you're in Boeing or anywhere else. There's some mid-level managers, and they're the ones that are with the troops every single day, and they're the ones who play the critical role of being a role model and a mentor. And, and that's what I think keeps us where we are. Yeah, you're both very consistent in the communication, staying close to the people, and uh, really focusing on the importance of what's being done, so. I'd also say it's caring. <clears throat> it's caring for the, not only the individual, but creating the conditions so that the individual's family can sustain the demands we're putting on them. And this is, I think, is key, is that normally it's an individual's own desire to join the organization that brings them in the front door. But when they leave, it's generally a family decision. Am I right in that regard? Okay, it's a family, it's, it's a family decision. And so you want to create the circumstances that the family can endure the rigors of service in the space business. We had a saying in the Marine Corps, it, we recruit individuals, you know, individual young men and women. We retain and we re-enlist families. And if you don't, you know, it, it's hard to keep a family together in, in, in a military environment. It is getting hard to keep families together in federal service, no matter where you are. It, it puts a lot of strain on people. And um, so one of the things I, I say to people is, look, a couple of things. Don't ask somebody how they're doing. Do not, do not begin your day by, by saying, how are you doing? Because every once in a while, somebody's going to say, I'm not doing worth a crap. And when they tell you that, you know, are you going to be the person that turns and runs away because you just don't want to hear it? Or are you going to say, OK, what's the problem? Are you going to be willing, like Walt said, are you going to be willing to take the time to say, hey, come here for a minute. Let me, let me talk to you. I, I, if, if I had a quarter for every time, I, I'm an emotional person. Everybody knows that in NASA. If I had a quarter for every time I I get out of the elevator and I'm, I am, I am in tears with somebody, you know, because I, I ask them how things are going and it turns out they've had a death in the family or somebody's been diagnosed with cancer. Those are really, really important, life-changing things that affect the way that they do their jobs. And if, if we don't at least let them know that we care about them, um, you know, where else are they going to go? They're probably not going to stay around the organization very long. Yeah, the importance of the people. Um, uh, this is a question from Jack uh, Gamal, who's a student and a young professional. Uh, and the question is, if you made a mistake during your career, and I guess the first part is if you've ever made a mistake during your career, how did, you, how did you go about changing the perception of your colleagues and higher ups uh, that you're still a professional? So, so how do you deal with mistakes when things go wrong? And I, I think people expect you to make mistakes, first of all. The, the, the mistake that people do not expect you to make is a violation of your integrity. Um, Marines will follow you to hell and back. Uh, I think people in NASA will follow me anywhere I go, hopefully. If I lie to them or if they have a feeling that I have deceived them or misled them, I'm toast. I mean, that's it. So uh, that's why I say, you know, just fess up. Um, I, if I make a mistake almost every day. And so somebody finds out about it because I tell them, <laughs> you know, I just say, okay, boy, I really screwed that one up. Um, but like Walt said, 
if you screw it up, then figure out how you did it, why you did it, and go back and try to correct it. It's like, it's like doing a dog on, uh, what did we call them after, after you did an exercise, a hot wash. You know, you do a hot wash, you say, okay, what did we do? And everybody feels like they did great, but in a hot wash, you don't care about, you don't care about, the, you, you're going, right? Yeah. You don't care about the good stuff. You do, but what's really important is, okay, how did we, what did we do wrong? And how can we correct that so that tomorrow we're that much better? You know, the thing about senior leadership is you never have perfect information, eh? You wish you had perfect information, and others assume you have perfect information. You never have perfect information, you don't. But you've got to make a call based upon the information that you have. And unfortunately, sometimes things go wrong. And it goes back to before putting the team ahead of you. If your only ambition is to get to the senior level, then when mistakes are made, you'll have difficulty accepting responsibility for the organization. And that's really bad because there's a potential that you may compromise your values for your own benefit. And, and that's the end of it. So my credo and, and what I've kind of said to, to, to my folks uh, in, my, in my uniform days, I had kind of like a few messages. One, first message, something goes wrong, go ugly early. <laughs> go ugly early. If there is a mess on your hands, you deal with it, you deal with it right away. Because the longer you linger, the worse it gets. Second, if it's your responsibility, accept responsibility right away. And everything that's involved in accepting responsibility, including resigning, okay, including resigning. And indeed, if you're putting the team ahead of you for the, for the institution, you'll say it's time to Go fish. Third, if the record is wrong, correct the record. I once met a journalist, and he's a great guy, I love the military, but he said, you guys in the military, you're all screwed up. The media gets it wrong, and then you don't come back and correct them. And if you don't correct them, it's deemed to be true. So correct the record. The final point is, whenever you walk up to a microphone and you're about to say something, Say it as if you're talking to your internal folks, to your own folks, and not to the outside world, who obviously are listening, but those inside, they know the truth. And they want to hear it from you. And if they hear it from you, they know it to be true. It reinforces that confidence that is so important in this high-risk risk venture that space is all about. Good. So here's a, uh, here's a tough one. It's an innovative question. Uh, no name, but the affiliation is CSA and NASA. So we have somebody out there who's working, collecting from both. Uh, you got to check on that. So the, yeah. So the question is, what is your favorite hockey team? And it's, and it's to both of you. What's your favorite hockey team? Ah. Ah. Winnipeg Jets. You know, I'm, I, I'm just wishy-washy, but since I live in Washington, I like the Caps. Is that the right answer? <laughs> well, and okay. also my, my, you know, my former chief of staff, soon to be my chief financial officer, Dave Resnowski, likes the Caps, although he's from Pittsburgh. So I, I said, how can you be a Cap fan? He said, I live here. So I live in Washington, so I'm a Cap. Show of hands, Toronto Maple Leaf fans. Montreal Canadiens. Nordiques. <laughs> Well, I'm a New York Rangers fan, so I'm kind of disappointed by the Stanley Cup. <laughs> you didn't ask him? Oh, I said right off the beginning. Yeah. Go Jets, go. <laughs> All right, so here's a question from Alex Berg, uh, also uh, George Washington University. It says, what steps do you each uh, believe must be taken to leverage additional supported funding from political leaders for your space agencies and what steps uh, do you as leaders uh, take in this endeavor? So how do we get uh, political leadership to uh, put more investment into space? And what's your role in that, that capacity? I guess what I'd say from, uh, again, being the, the somewhat new guy coming in, I, I think governments around the world uh, recognize that space is essential in terms of providing services to their folks. They recognize 
uh, the potential of, of emerging technologies and innovation. They cherish the international partnerships and they recognize the national branding uh, and the intangibles that inspiring the youth are all about. But in some cases, that's not enough to open the purse. What, because again, normally policy is driven by finances. They want to see the economic value proposition. That's what they want to see. And that's what, from a Canadian Space Agency, we're trying to do right now, is to recognize that across from coast to coast to coast, um, that the, the Canadian industry, working with Canadian universities and colleges, are doing things and we're not capturing what they do. And we got to do better at it. We spend a lot of time on the Hill trying to nurture trust among the staff and the members, uh, and also a lot of time in the executive office of the president, because we have to go to places. You know, the, the president proposes and the Congress disposes, is the way it works in the U.S. Um, and, and you have to get, you have to get consensus um, between those two, or you won't get anything at all. So we try to develop a strategy that we present to both ends. Of, I say to both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, and uh, and you know the first thing is to make sure that that becomes the president's strategy, and then once that's done, uh, we'll try to present it to the Congress and, and sell them and win them and get them to endorse it. And obviously also the successful of existing projects yeah. probably helps. The more success you have, the more people want to put in. And, so and little projects are very important. Um, every pro There is no unimportant project. Every single one, you want to tell people what, you, what you're going to do, how much it's going to cost, and then you want to deliver. Uh, we've been very fortunate in NASA in, of late in that we have pretty much uh, kept a schedule and kept a cost. There's always exceptions, but but we've had um, we've had a good run of, of being on time and on cost or below cost on some of the some of the programs we've been doing. And so here's a, here's a question about what you look for in terms of the the, the new generation of leaders. And this is from uh, Andrea and Ilji. So it's a joint question from Spain and Korea from the space generation uh, folks. Are there any skills that you think are lacking or weak? in the current space leaders that my generation, meaning folks born in the 1980s, should pick up and make sure to improve or strengthen. And in, in case of some of us in this room become uh, next space agency leaders. So assuming this is, these are the folks who are gonna be taking over, are there uh, weaknesses you see right now in terms of uh, the leadership approach uh, that you wanna emphasize for them to pay attention to, things that they can do more of? I wouldn't say it's a weakness. I'd just say it's a necessity. Um, is is um, uh, gaining an ability to think about and care for your people. That that you know you've got to you have to work on it all the time. Um, the issue I raised earlier, diversity and inclusion, it never goes away. You know you can you can think you're doing really well about building a, a diverse organization, and you look up, you pat yourself on the back, and you look up, and you walk away, and you know next year you go, where did all the people go? Because you've gotten them in, but now you got to keep them, and you have to make sure that that the workplace is a place that they want to continue to work. And 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 being inclusive is really hard because it means you have to listen to dissenting voices sometimes, or you have to listen to voices that don't necessarily uh, uh, you don't want to hear the message they're bringing. And so that's hard. Uh, you know, from my perspective, I, I wouldn't. Uh can't observe any shortcomings whatsoever. My concern, and, and I've shared this with our team, is how do we continue to train folks coming in so that they can grow into the senior leadership? How, how do you give them the different experiences that Charlie and I had uh, moving through? Because, you know, 38 years ago, I wasn't the leader I am now. You know, it was all of the variety of postings, assignments, operations, staff, and then schoolhouses. I mean, I had like over three years of professional development after I became a tank commander. Three years of staff colleges and so on that was not you know, germane to my trade, but was about uh, problem solving, operational, strategic thinking, uh, and then working with others, collaboration, and all that kind of thing. So how do you do that? You know, militaries can afford these huge uh, 
professional development uh, organizations, which in the civilian world, especially in industry, they can. And what I see often in terms of the public service, we bring folks in with extraordinary uh, academic backgrounds, you know, great masters, uh, multiple masters, PhDs, and so on, but then we don't give them those next tools. You know, so they come out of various shops being great platoon commanders where they're working, but do they, we give them this, the tools and the training to move up? And, and I think that's something we've got to work on. And so here's a global question uh, from Vincent Tan of the Woodland School. And he says, you mentioned Iraq and Afghanistan. And there were wars happening all around the world. Is NASA or the Canadian Space Agency doing anything to help solve conflicts and promote world, promote world peace, such as using space exploration and collaboration to create a sense of nationalism for the world? So is there, with, with the things going on in the in spite world, of In spite of everything going on, Walt and me and the other three heads of agency, heads of the International Space Station agencies, uh, contrary to what people believe, we are working diligently all the time to make sure that the International Space Station just keeps humming. Uh, and it is not at all immune from what's going on down here on Earth. And we were talking about it, we were talking about it earlier today, even the crews are not immune to what's going on down here. And, and we find that every once in a while in some of these downlink interviews, crews are natural, normal people. And there have been any number of times where you know you have a Russian and an American crew member uh, doing a downlink TV session, and all of a sudden one of them talks about learning how to collaborate, and how to get along, and and talks about in spite of everything going on down here. So I, I always call the the um, the ISS is 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 a space-born United Nations, and I think what we can do is make sure that 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 partnership remains whole and viable and functioning because it is, it is one of the best examples that we have today about uh, of how the world should be and how it can be when people are willing to put themselves second and work on a common goal uh, for the good of humanity because every single crew member uh, is really trying to make sure that everything they do every day is getting back down here to the ground to make life better for people here. And, and that's what's really important about it. I just want to reinforce that, say, the International Space Station just reinforces the extraordinary value of long-term relationships. That global situations come and go, but the relationships built over time endure. And we've got to reinforce those long-term relationships. So here's a question about decision-making. And it uh, goes, what's the most difficult decision you've had to make in your current role as administrator? Both of you. Is there a most difficult decision? Mine are always about people. You know, it's uh, how do you tell somebody they're not performing? Now, I, I am one of the world's worst. I, I admit that. Now, you would think that, uh, you know, after 34 years in the Marine Corps, I'd be able to just get in somebody's face and say, "You're just not. You're not pulling your share of the. I'm bad. I'm horrible. I'm terrible." Uh, we are now about to go into what we call, it's the, it's the annual appraisal time, you know this, for, for the senior executive service, and I just agonize. Because everybody, you know, everybody is not the best performer in the world. Everybody has something um, that, that they don't do as well as others do. And just to, to have to offer you know, constructive criticism to somebody, I don't find that to be very easy. And it's, but it's absolutely necessary, and it's, it is the only way to be fair to the people who are your subordinates. They can't, they can't correct themselves if you don't tell them that there's something that needs improvement. And, and I struggle all the time. I wish I had, you know, something really hard that you dealt with. What I love I about even death. <laughs> what I love about space thus far is no one's getting hurt. You know, I love that because my former life folks got hurt, got hurt a lot. So, you know, all the tough decisions are about people. And, you know, speaking truth, not only to power, but to folks who work for you. Speaking truth is like really important and it's really hard. 
and it's always easier just to pass it by. And you're not helping anybody out. You're not helping anybody out. In my former life, I used to bring someone in and say, hey, sunshine, you ain't got it. You're terrific. Like, you're terrific. But this is not working out. And have those folks come back a little while later and say, sir, thanks. First time I heard it. And recognize that they were at a waypoint in their life and they were able to change course and be successful it is absolutely essential. And so the organization is happy but you'll find that your hardest decisions are about, folk, about people because you don't want to be the bad guy, but you're the leader. And you're, we're paying you to make hard decisions. And because I know some, there's some of you who are disappointed that I say it's about people, you, you wanted to hear something about a budget or about a program or something. I see, I see some here as well. That's hard too, but, but like Walt said, that's our job. And so you take the incomplete information that you have, uh, do the best you can to apply the lessons that you've learned through years, uh, do a little mental assessment of past performance of the various programs, and you say, okay, that one, you know, we've been struggling there, so if we gotta cut something, that one's just, that's, that's not the obvious candidate, but that's probably the one that we should back off of for right now. That, it's, it, it, that too is difficult, but, but still not as, not as agonizing as the people is. Absolutely. There isn't anything you want to tell me, Mr. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> um, final two questions uh, we're coming to in terms of time. Both of you have had, I mean, you've had incredible careers in, in terms of space now, in terms of military. How did you go about continuing to learn? Because some people you see get to the point where, you get, where they feel they've got it, and they kind of, they stop. Uh, are there certain things you do, uh, either people you talk to or you know, training things that you like to do? How do you keep learning? How have you done that throughout your career? Mine's really simple. I learned a long time ago there is no such thing as a dumb question. And since there is no such thing as a dumb question, and most people are embarrassed to, add, to ask any question, uh, I look around at some people who have briefed me before. I am the dumb question asker at NASA headquarters. Uh, and it's not because I'm trying to catch anybody or anything, it's just because I don't know and I'm constantly trying to, to you know, enrich myself or refresh myself or learn something new. So you, you cannot learn if you're not willing to ask questions and have somebody say, I can't believe he didn't know that. Because I have people I can tell, I can look in their eyes sometimes and they go, I don't believe he didn't know that. But guess what? I didn't know that. So ask questions, uh, General Wall. My team is terrific because they have extraordinary patience. You got this? You, uh, write it down. <laughs> My team has extraordinary patience. You know when you talk to your puppy and try to tell your puppy something and the puppy does this? <laughs> I'm doing that a lot. <laughs> okay? Uh, they're, they're very patient, but no. My former life, you know, I'm a tanker. And at the end, I was dealing with the Army, Navy, Air Force, Special Forces, on the engineering side, project management side. You had to continually learn and recognize that you will not know everything. And you've got to be comfortable with imperfect information. And the fact is, the higher you go up into the organization, this hierarchy, you get closer to the, to the peak of this, of this uh, organization, the less you'll know but that you will put your absolute trust into those who work for you and recognize that you only see a little bit of what they do. And what you see will confirm whether they're on track, they're totally aligned with you, or they're away they go. See, I, I got four guys sitting over here. They talk about stuff all, see, they think I'm deaf. <laughs> they, they talk about decisions all day long, and they, they have all these problems that come in, and they're whispering. And I'm sitting right here, you know, and, and every once in a while I'll say, what was that? And they'll say, oh, don't worry about it. And I'll say, no, but I am worried about it. I, you, you, got, you, peak my, you got my my curiosity up here, but they take care of us. And, uh, and, and you know, but again, it's because of the trust that's developed uh, with, with the team. And so when they come with something, I got a guy that sits down here who writes for me. And you hear me say something, read something, or give a speech, 
a guy named Gray Hadalama said, it, and, I, and they get really embarrassed. I, and they told me one time, you're not supposed to call them out. They're supposed to be, that nobody in the world is supposed to know they exist. But, but he and another guy named, named, named Terry, or Terry Edmonds, I have the best speech writers in the world. Uh, and it's because they spend a lot of time knowing how I talk, knowing what I want to say, and then putting it in words for me. And um, so you've just got to, you've got to have a team that knows that you trust them, uh, and they do incredible stuff. Very good. So we come down to the final question. Well, this is a question that uh, when you look back on your careers, so we have young professionals here in the room, is there something that you know now that you wish you had known when you were starting your career? And is it something that, uh, that young professionals, space leaders, should keep in mind? Is there something that, looking back, that you know it now, you wish you kind of do it at an earlier point, and, and maybe it's this some is final really, advice? This is really trivial, but remember the singer yesterday? The second song he sang? Uh, I think I knew this. I love what I'm doing. <laughs> I am, uh, if I died tomorrow, um, I would have had a perfect life. I just, I am uh, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. So keep doing what and you're I supposed to do. may not have known that yesterday or something. Oh. The advice I give to a lot of folks is um, declare success early. As you launch in your careers, at what point do you declare success? And remove the yoke of ambition from your shoulders so you're happy with your lot of life right then and then. And it, it might be a career pursuit, it might be an academic pursuit, it might be an athletic pursuit, it might be a family pursuit. But what does success look like? And when I kicked out, started on this career, I wanted to be a captain. Because I'd been a cadet, and I put a captain on a pedestal, so whoa, when I get to be captain, it's going to be incredible. I made it. And then later on, I figured, no, actually, it's commanding my regiment. But then that was it. Like, no kidding, that was it. I said, everything beyond this is gravy. Because I made a contribution, I'm happy. And I gave that message out to all the budding general officers, all those great chief warrant officers, the chiefs and petty officers, and I said, so declare success. And you know what, I'd be in the middle of combat somewhere and a special forces commander would come up to me and said, sir, I've declared success. <laughs> and when you do that, you put the team ahead of you. And able to care for people and build the relationships that are vital to the space business and our former business. This has been great. It's, uh, I'm thrilled to be working for, well, I'm working for NASA, so I get to work for you, but how many of you want to work for these guys? <laughs> I want to close by thanking uh, the IAF for giving us this place and location. I want to thank the Canadian Space Agency folks for making this really easy to set up, and also for the recording. Uh, we record it because as part of Lessons Learned, there's a lot of folks who can't be here. And uh, we'll, we'll p take out uh, key components of this that are, you know, interesting answers, and we'll make that available. And so we use that over and over again. And uh, also want to thank, uh, you know, Kevin Stubbe, who incredible job boys and the young professionals in making this easy. And uh, also, uh, you know, Stacy Edgington, who, uh, Stacy makes this whole thing happen. Is, uh, I, uh, yeah. even, even within NASA, all the questions come, they usually come from Obi's folks and from Anthony, what's going on, and Stacy answers the question, and then I get to do this, so it's really fun, so and thank, thank Anthony, and, Paul, and particularly uh, really thanking General Walt Detention and Charlie Bolden uh, for, I think, what's been a great, great night. I could have gone longer. So let's thank them one more time.